Hi everyone, my name is Josh Lewison and I'm a barrister specialising in private clients and insolvency. At the Chancery Bar, giving expert advice on law and tactics is at the heart of what we do, and a lot of sets of chambers will ask you to write an opinion as part of the recruitment process. So I've come up to the roof of Radcliffe Chambers, with its great view of the Royal Courts of Justice and Lincoln's Inn, where some of you may hope to practice, to give you my 10 top tips for writing opinions. Tip number one, give some advice. The clue is in the name. You're being asked to give your opinion on some aspects of the case. This is not a law essay. Your client has questions and you need to have the answers. Giving a list of options is unlikely to be good enough. Apart from anything else, your instructing solicitor probably knows what the options are. And even in a case where there are multiple options, you should at least be able to give your view on what the best option is. If you really can't be definitive, explain why not. What information would allow you to reach a conclusion and how? I remember reading one disastrous opinion in which counsel had advised that the prospects of success were between 40 and 60%. And what do we think the client made of that, having paid a handsome sum only to be told that maybe they would win and maybe they would lose? So always, always give some advice, even if the advice is out of the direction of further investigation. Tip number two, be clear about who you're writing for and tailor your language and advice accordingly. We're barristers, we're instructed by solicitors, all of us are lawyers. So it can be tempting to write just for your instructing solicitor, lawyer to lawyer, but you have a lay client too. It's their case. They pay the bills and they stand to win or lose. With any opinion I write, I do my best to make sure that the client can read it and understand it, both linguistically and in terms of the reasoning. And that varies from client to client. If you're advising a layperson, they might know what a trust is, but will probably need a bit of help to understand a fiduciary duty. If you're advising a professional trustee, on the other hand, they're likely to be more on top of things. More importantly, if you write your opinion for a purely legal audience, your instructing solicitor is going to have to translate it. And I've seen a professional negligence case in which the translation was wrong. If you have something to say to the client, best to say it yourself. Tip number three, begin with the answer. We've all read judgments that launch straight into a detailed account of the facts, and before you know it, you're 20 paragraphs deep and you still don't know what the issues are. I start my opinions by saying who I'm advising and what the broad issues are. I can usually squeeze that into a single paragraph, and never more than two. Then I list out the questions asked. That gives me and the reader a record of the precise issues on which my advice is sought. Then I do a summary of conclusions to answer the questions one by one in the order given, unless I've got a good reason to go out of order, and preferably in one or two sentences each. Now this is only a summary of conclusions, there's more detail elsewhere, and this is normally the last thing that I write. That means that the busy reader should not have to read beyond page one to know what you've advised. And there's another aspect to this too. Your client may be an individual going through one of the most difficult experiences of their life, litigation, and they won't appreciate a cliffhanger. Tip number four, get the facts right. Your instructions normally come with an overview of the facts. This is only designed to introduce you to the case and to guide you through the papers. Don't be tempted to copy it or pracy it. When you write your own account of the facts, you do three things. First, you fit the, fix the facts in your own mind so that you can get a better insight into the legal issues. Secondly, you're giving your instructing solicitor and your client and insight into your thought process by detailing what you think is relevant and what's not. This is important because if they think you've missed anything out, they can bring it to your attention and you can revise your opinion if necessary. Third, you're creating a record for a later reader. If your opinion is picked up sometime in the future, and doing trust work, I've read opinions 20 or 30 years old, you're telling the reader what the facts were as you understood them, which will be helpful if the documentary record is incomplete. Tip number five, get the law right. This goes back to giving advice. Normally there's at least one legal question that you need to answer before you can tell your clients what you think they should do. It's probably a difficult question, and that's why your solicitor has asked for your help. But if you can't have, at least have a go at answering it, then you probably haven't added very much value. So how can you get the law right? I always remember an interview given by Lord Sumption just before he joined the Supreme Court. He was asked whether there had ever been a question so difficult that he couldn't answer it. He said that there hadn't, because sooner or later the question was likely to come before the court 
And then the court would have to answer it. And if a judge could answer the question, so could he. On a more practical level, it's often helpful to break down a big issue into smaller issues. If you're asked what trustees can do about a disadvantageous exercise of their powers, that can helpfully be broken down into a question as to the scope of their powers, the manner in which they've exercised their powers, whether the transaction can be set aside for mistake, and whether it might be rectified. And if the law is unclear, then go back to Lord Sumption. What arguments will the judge hear, and which will he or she think is the most persuasive? Or to look at it another way, which one would you be more confident arguing? Tip number six, edit, edit, edit. Nobody expects you to write an opinion in one go. As you go along, some facts that seemed relevant at first may fall away and others may emerge from the background. You may find that points of law that you thought were crucial, in fact, don't assist. Writing an opinion is an iterative process, and as your grasp of the facts and your reasoning of the legal points evolves, so should your opinion. Tip number seven, advise in the real world. Some people call this being commercial. This isn't the same as being mercenary, and certainly doesn't mean that you're practicing commercial law. It's more about being realistic. Which points are the important ones? What is it worth spending time and money on? What matters to the client? What's their priority? To give you an example, think about a will dispute, perhaps where you're advising a beneficiary in a claim brought by their sibling who's been disinherited. The merits of the sibling's claim may be poor, but what's your client's priority? To fight it out for two years, no matter what? To preserve family relations? To get a quick settlement, move on with their life? You may not know, and that's fine. What's important is to be aware of these considerations. This is real life, not a problem question. Tip number eight. Identify the solutions as well as the problems. Picture this, you're a solicitor, you go to counsel with a legal problem. Counsel comes back with four more problems. How helpful is that? It's often quite easy to spot problems, gaps in the evidence, uncertainties in the law. And it's important to do that so that you're not taken by surprise later on. But I've always taken the view that fundamentally our job is to get our client into the best position possible. And that does mean spotting problems, but it also means finding the solutions. Otherwise, you've only done half the job. Tip number nine, make sure that you answer the questions. So you've got the facts, you've got the law. Do please remember to apply the one to the other and come up with some conclusions, whether on the merits of the case or the next steps to take, supported by reasons. The most important word you can use here is because. Because it will help you to show your reasoning. And remember that list of questions and summary of conclusions at the beginning? This is a great way of checking that you've answered everything you've been asked. What if you think a question's irrelevant? Well, first of all, consider the possibility you might be wrong about that. But second, even if it is irrelevant, it may be emotionally important to the client, even if the case doesn't turn on it. So answer the question anyway. Tip number 10, don't worry about it. This doesn't mean that you shouldn't take your cases seriously. Of course you should. The client has trusted you, a perfect stranger, to advise them on how to get through a difficult situation on which their prosperity, livelihood, or reputation may depend. But once you've produced your opinion, if you're satisfied that you've addressed the problem to the best of your ability, you have to let it go. If you carry on fretting about it, you won't do yourself any good mentally, and it's unlikely to help your clients. And here's a bonus tip, maybe not so much one for pupillage applicants, but once you remember once you're in practice, nobody ever complained that an opinion was on time and within the budget. So those are my top tips, and I wish you the best of luck in your pupillage applications. Thanks for watching.